Okay. Hello and welcome to the Wiser Tomorrow podcast. Today I'm honored to be speaking with Avi Loeb. Avi is the former chair of the astronomy department at Harvard University and is the current director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, the founding director of the Harvard University Black Hole Initiative, and the head of the Galileo Project. Beyond his academic work, Avi has also become a major figure in the world of science communication, having written several books, including his most recent bestseller, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth, and has a new book scheduled for publication later in 2023 titled Interstellar. On top of all this, Avi has appeared on many of the biggest media outlets and writes regularly on his blog, covering a range of topics and ideas that are at the heart of his work. So again, Avi, thank you so much for coming on, and it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. So before we get into the more strictly scientific topics, I want to talk a little bit about your background. Again, I know you've appeared on many different outlets and talked about this in depth, but one thing I'd like to linger on for a moment is your background as, as they say in Israel, as a Moshavnik, because I feel like, you know, Israel already has a disproportionate number of prominent intellectuals relative to their population, but it seems like a good portion also come from the Moshav or Kibbutz, but specifically the Moshav. So I was wondering if you think there's anything to be said there about the way of life growing up on a Moshav being conducive to intellectual and academic thought. Well, for me, it made a huge difference because uh, I grew up on a farm. I used to collect eggs every afternoon. You could have saved time if you were to describe me as a farm boy because I haven't <laughs> changed much. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed the, uh, the interaction with nature more than the interaction with people. I'm still frustrated by some people. And uh, nature, you know, even though sometimes it's uh, uh, not accommodating what we need, uh, nevertheless, it's sort of innocent. And uh, that brings joy in the interaction. And f for example, today I jog uh, every morning at uh, sunrise and I really enjoy the company of birds, ducks, uh, wild turkeys, bunnies. Um, so that's one thing, the connection to nature and the best uh, a manifestation of that is being a scientist because um, a science is all about learning uh, what nature is and you know I don't want any makeup I don't want to put goggles on my head uh, imagine uh, a reality that is different than the one we all share in the metaverse for example even if it's it brings me pleasure uh, I want to see the pimples on the face of reality and the best way to learn about reality is by collecting scientific evidence and, uh, you know, regarding it as a learning experience. So that's what uh, I absorbed when I grew up um, on a farm uh, embedded in nature, the respect to nature rather than what people say, which is often distorted. Uh, because people have ambitions. Uh, they want, for example, to be significant in the big scheme of things. Unfortunately, that's not the case. You know, uh, the universe is huge. Uh, we just came to exist as the human species a few million years ago, and that's one part in 100,000 of the age of the universe, and we are not at the center of the stage. So if you come to a play and you arrive at the end of the play, you are not at the center of stage, the play is not about you. That's a very simple conclusion. And unfortunately, most of my colleagues refuse to admit that. They uh, realize now that we are not at the center of the universe, but they still want to be, to believe that uh, we are the most intelligent species uh, that ever existed since the Big Bang. And I argue, you know, look, there are tens of billions of other planets like the Earth around stars like the Sun, roughly at the same separation. And moreover, you know, uh, most of the stars from billions of years before us. So it's very likely that there was an Albert Einstein on an exoplanet a billion years ago. And, you know, if we, if we have to pay the price of our arrogance for the sake of learning something completely new from a civilization that is a billion years older than us, than our science, so be it. I'm willing to pay that price rather than maintain my arrogance the way many of my colleagues do. And the point is, it's not an extraordinary claim to say that something more intelligent than us existed, predated us. It's actually extraordinary to claim otherwise, given the numbers. And uh, uh, even if you say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, I say extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. Without funding the search, we will never find anything. So all of these are 
common sense, you know, that I developed by being a farm boy, you know, not pretending to know more than I know. So it has two aspects, the connection to nature and not uh, trying to appease everyone, not, not being uh, betraying what, you know, appears to be reasonable to what other people like to hear. And uh, sometimes I feel like uh, the kid in Hans Christian Andersen's uh, story where, you know, I say the emperor has no clothes when I talk about modern science and, you know, and everyone else says, no, no, they, it has clothes and, you know, people want to feel respected and so forth. But the way I see it is let's learn about the reality we all share rather than try to show off that we are smart. Yeah, I would completely agree. And that definitely makes a lot of sense. And I guess it's just the the Copernican principle, right? I mean, I'm surprised to hear that a lot of your colleagues are still sort of insistent that, that we have some special significance. Well, part of it is because experts get their reputation and stature. They get honors, awards um, by basically uh, celebrating past knowledge. Okay. And they have they establish echo chambers where the students and, and postdocs are supposed to repeat their mantras so that the, their voice is louder, okay? And uh, instead, you know, one should encourage young people to be innovative, to explore new paths rather than, uh, you know, celebrate our past knowledge because our past knowledge is just an island in an ocean of ignorance. So science is a, a continuous process of learning. And unfortunately, that's what, not what experts want. They want their time to be the end of science. You know, there was this uh, famous physicist, Michelson, uh, that uh, about 125 years ago, gave a speech at uh, the uh, inauguration of a new uh, physics laboratory at uh, uh, Chicago. And uh, he said, you know, at the end of uh, the 19th century, he said, well, we pretty much know that we're at the end of physics uh, there is not much to find, and all that we will be engaged in in the coming years is figuring out uh, or measuring uh, fundamental constants to the sixth decimal point. And boy, was he wrong, because just, uh, you know, uh, less than a decade later, Einstein came up with a special theory of relativity, and a decade after that, with a general theory of relativity, and then quantum mechanics was discovered five years after that. And all of this, um, you know, change revolutionized the way we think about reality, because the quantum reality is very different than the reality that Michelson believed in. And so what I'm saying is that it's a never ending process. And moreover, you know, science is an infinite sum game. It's everyone benefits when you get new knowledge, new scientific knowledge. It's unlike zero-sum games that we play with each other, where if someone gets more money, other people lose the money, or, you know, when the total is fixed. Uh, that's the games we are used to, playing with each other. But science is very different. It's an infinite-sum game, meaning that if anyone gains new knowledge, then all humans benefit from it. You know, uh, I had a, uh, the head of a, an office in government uh, visit my home um, a few months ago, and he said, if we find that there are extraterrestrial technological gadgets uh, by monitoring the sky, the President of the United States would be the first one to know. And I said, that makes very little sense, because um, anything to do with the universe uh, has, you know, does not adhere to national borders. It's just like saying, if we learn that uh, the most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. The president should be the first to know. That makes no sense. You should publish that in a scientific paper, which Cecilia Payne Kopashkin, the first PhD in astronomy at Harvard, Radcliffe uh, did. I mean, a, a century ago, she discovered it in her PhD. And the point is that it's not supposed to be the privilege uh, exclusive to the president. I mean, it's not a national security matter. It's something that has to do with the universe that all humans should share. And so what I'm saying is science is very different from politics. Politics is about separating people, whereas science is about unifying them, giving all of them the knowledge that we have. And therefore, it's an infinite sum game. And therefore, 
we should all work with each other. And therefore, it's not about us showing off so that we get honors and awards. It's about us admitting that there, there are some things we don't know. And if we find something new, we should not resist it. We should not shove it under the rug. We should not ridicule people uh, for arguing it because that delays our progress. That's a sign of not being intelligent. And that's been the heart of your work. I mean, with the Muumuu -Muu and everything else is really just stat challenging the status quo and making people say this isn't, this shouldn't be some weird taboo. This is, this is the next frontier. And there's good reason to say it, it's time is now. Well, for most of my career, I try to please other people with the hope that they will give me honors, awards, titles, and so forth. I was chair of the astronomy department at Harvard for nine years, the longest serving chair. I chaired the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies. I, um, so I, I was part of the establishment, but a few years ago, my parents passed away and I realized we, we live for such a short time. And if we spend all of our time trying to impress other people, uh, we will get to the end of our life you know, and regret that we haven't really explored the most fascinating things just because other people ridiculed it or didn't, it was not fashionable at the time. And I don't have any footprint on social media. And a few years ago, you know, when this, uh, five years ago, when uh, Oumuamua, this object that came close to Earth and was the first one to be noticed from outside the solar system uh, appear, was detected by a telescope in Hawaii, uh, everyone believed that it's a rock uh, from another star, but then it showed the, the qualities that are very different than all the space rocks we had seen from the solar system. It, it was uh, flat in its shape. It was extreme um, from the fact that it reflected the sunlight by, um, and, and, and as it was turning around, it was uh, changing its uh, the amount of reflected sunlight by a factor of 10. And then it was pushed away from the sun without uh, evaporating, without showing any cometary tail. And, and uh, I suggested that it's artificial in origin because the only thing I could think of is that it's being pushed by reflecting sunlight. And indeed, uh, <clears throat> three years later, there was another object discovered by the same telescope in Hawaii. It was given the name 2020 SO. Uh, and in, um, it was uh, pushed away from the sun by reflecting sunlight, no cometary tail. And then the astronomers realized, oh, it's actually a rocket booster that was launched in 1966 by NASA. And we know that it's artificial because we produced it. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And I was not willing to back down from the possibility that it's artificial in origin. Uh, my colleagues insisted that it must be natural. But then they had to argue that it's a rock of a type that we've never seen before, like a hydrogen iceberg, nitrogen iceberg, a dust bunny. All of these things have issues, have challenges. Uh, hydrogen iceberg, uh, indeed, it would evaporate without being uh, visible. It would be transparent, but it would uh, evaporate on a time scale that is rather short, shorter than the travel time through interstellar space. And then a nitrogen iceberg is just, um, there is a problem with the mass budget. There isn't enough nitrogen, solid nitrogen on the surfaces of planets like Pluto uh, to account for a large enough population of objects. And then a dust bunny, which is a hundred times less dense than air, would get heated by hundreds of degrees and wouldn't survive coming close to the sun. And uh, <clears throat> so I, I say, you know, the situation is similar to a cave dweller finding a cell phone and saying that it's a rock of a type that he had never seen before. Of course, if the cave dweller has a kid, uh, then the kid might uh, be curious and not uh, assume that it's a rock, but press a button and realize that it records his voice. Yeah, and it seems like the problem with the Muumuu, though, is that a, we're at a dead end in terms of just probing it. We can't really capture and image it for the time being, and that's sort of what's led you to focus on these other interstellar objects, right? Most exactly. notably, of course, being the one you're leading the expedition to later this year. Exactly. So uh, to me, it was the beginning of um, a, a, a research program uh, because it, it's a wake-up call that we should get more evidence. As I said, science is not dictated by beliefs 
or by wishes, it's supposed to be guided by evidence. Now, of course, if you know the answer in advance, you will never seek evidence. And as a result, you will not be proven wrong, which is a tactic adopted by, surprisingly, a lot of scientists. They say, we know the answer, we don't need any demonstration. But obviously, if we came close to Oumuamua, we could tell if it's a hydrogen iceberg, a nitrogen iceberg, or a dust bunny. If it's a dust bunny, we could fly through it, okay? And we would never crash on its surface. So, obviously, with good enough evidence, you could tell the difference. And obviously, if it was an uh, artificial in origin, we would notice the screws and bolts, and we could, in principle, read off the label made on exoplanet Y, you know? So, I say, let's get better data, and come close to a, f a future Oumuamua-like object. I call it dating the next Oumuamua and um, get a high resolution image because a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, 66,000 words. I wouldn't write the book if I had a photo album of Oumuamua, obviously. And uh, so the, uh, that's one goal of uh, the research program that I defined as the Galileo project. Uh, and by the way, this, this research program uh, was enabled by a, a group of very wealthy individuals that were inspired by my book, uh, Extraterrestrial, and decided to give me money uh, without me doing any fundraising. Uh, I got uh, more than $4 million in one year. And so I established the Galileo project that is aiming to, to figure out what objects like Oumuamua are. And um, a couple of years after Oumuamua was discovered, it turned out that it's not the first from outside the solar system. Uh, in fact, we, the U.S. government detected a, an object that appeared as a meteor. It collided with Earth and burned up in the Earth's atmosphere as a result of the friction with the air. Uh, and it did it about 10 kilometers above the ocean surface near Papua New Guinea. And um, we analyzed First of all, the speed of this object realized that it came from outside the solar system and was uh, detected back in, on January 8, uh, 2014, so about four years before Oumuamua. And um, at first, my colleagues disputed that. They said they don't believe the U.S. government data on this object. But um, in March 2022, the U.S. Uh, Space Command issued a letter um, confirming uh, that indeed our conclusion is correct at the 99.999% confidence. And so our paper was accepted for publication. And um, moreover, a few months later, we discovered another meteor in the same catalog uh, that came from in an interstellar origin. And the strange thing is that both of them are the toughest objects in the catalog based on the government data they exploded relatively low in the atmosphere, so they maintained very strong stress given their high speed. And uh, from that, we can tell that they are tougher than iron. And the question is, what are they made of? So we are planning an expedition uh, in a few months uh, to collect um, the fragments of the first interstellar meteor from the ocean floor. And we have the funding, we have the team that includes some of the world's experts in expeditions, ocean expeditions, and I'm willing to sleep on the deck of the boat. We have, uh, we found the boat. And so it should be very exciting to figure out what this object was made of. Was it uh, a rock or was it a spacecraft uh, made of uh, um, some artificial alloy like stainless steel? And um, I promised the curator of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, that I'll, if we find any gadget, I'll bring it for display, because for us, it would represent modernity. Yeah, and I think, uh, I, I mean, even if it ends up being some naturally occurring alloy, that, that itself is obviously also a very interesting finding. But as you talk about in the blog, one of the challenging things is just locating it, because if I remember correctly, it was something the size of a watermelon, and that's prior to it fragmenting into probably, what, millimeter to centimeter scale fragments? And that's not even accounting for, I mean, I, you talked about in the blog that there's been a lot of creative thinking in terms of sort of pinpointing where it might have landed. But then you have to factor in it drifting across the ocean floor or being covered by sediment. So are you optimistic that you will be able to find these fragments? 
Yeah, I'm always optimistic because if you don't search, you don't find anything. So, uh, but um, indeed, the the uncertainty in the localization of the meteor site was uh, about 10 kilometers on a side, uh, based on the government data. But uh, over the past couple of weeks, with my student uh, Amir Siraj, who helped me discover this object we were able to retrieve some public data from a seismometer on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. And using that data, we narrowed the uncertainty uh, by at least a factor of 10. So now we will be able to survey a strip that is rather narrow. Um, and uh, that improves the chances that we will visit the right location. Uh, and to me, it's a very satisfying uh, experience to basically use data and figure it out. What, what turns out to be the case is that this uh, audio signal, this um, uh, sound wave that was detected by the seismometer could have gone through air or through water and uh, the ocean floor. And uh, along each of these paths, um, we calculated how the signal will be broadened because of reflections, for example, from the ocean surface. And um, we ended up describing the signal that was observed. So at first it looked uh, paradoxical because the explosion was less than a second uh, in duration. And the, the sound signal was uh, a minute in duration. So the question is why so broad? And it's all as a result of the reflections from the ocean. And uh, we were able to explain the envelope of the sound signal. And that was very satisfying for me that it's sort of like um, Richard Feynman said, uh, there is a pleasure in figuring things out uh, because you have some data. And then once you understand it, it all comes into place. At first it looks puzzling. And uh, that's the beauty of uh, physics, of science. You know, I was interested in philosophy at a young age, in the big questions, but when you do science, there is a pleasure in the sense that you get some data, which was obtained by instruments, and then once you understand it, it all falls into place. It's sort of like a detective story, and understanding it is a great pleasure. You know, if you try to understand politics or anything to do with humans, you know, that's very complex and often doesn't have just one interpretation. Uh, but um, understanding the physical reality uh, often has one valid interpretation if you have good enough data. Yeah, absolutely. And that brings me very nicely into referencing two of your other blog posts where we sort of touch on this from a different perspective. And the two I'm referring to are the unexplored dimension of the universe and the most exciting signals start in the noise. So I suppose you could summarize these about being about intellectual creativity and finding meaning in these signals that we sort of just take at face value. So first, just for anyone listening, if you might be able to sort of summarize the arguments in these posts. Yeah, so um, um, what is uh, interesting about um, the way we think about the reality is that we are often fooled by wishful thinking. And the example that I brought up is uh, the, community, the Orthodox community in Crown Heights, uh, Brooklyn, that uh, believe that the rabbi, the Lubavitcher, is the Messiah. Okay, now that's a perfectly fine idea, theoretical idea. Uh, and of course, um, yeah, the way to test it is when, uh, if when the rabbi dies, he comes back as the Messiah. That, that's the prediction, right? So there is a theoretical prediction associated with this idea. And uh, so he died and didn't come back. And then they came, they came up with uh, a way to explain it, that they need to wait. But before that, they actually made a replica of his apartment in Brooklyn and put it in Israel so that uh, he will find the toilet when he comes back. Um, and uh, it's interesting. So uh, on the one hand, you think, OK, well, that's the realm of uh, a belief system but science should do better. So I was uh, visiting actually the Weizmann Institute in Israel uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, at breakfast, I met uh, a string theorist who worked on supersymmetry. That's a new symmetry of nature. 
um, that was popular for decades, okay? And uh, he was telling me how happy he was to discover this and that uh, insights within supersymmetry. And then uh, I, I, uh, it reminded me of the Lubavitcher rabbi story because uh, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN uh, was searching for supersymmetry. This is an experiment that uh, cost us uh, $10 billion and, of course, discovered the Higgs, which was a major confirmation of uh, old physics from the 60s. But in, in terms of looking for new physics, it was searching for supersymmetry. didn't find it didn't find it in the natural range of parameters. And um, so then what was the response of the physics community? Just like the Lubavitcher, they said, well, maybe we need to build a bigger accelerator. It's just around the corner. It will happen. Uh, and, um, you know, that is that shows that the way scientists work on a problem is not very different from a belief system quite often because they don't give up on an idea just because the evidence does not support it, okay? And um, on the other hand, so this is mainstream. I'm talking about mainstream of theoretical mm -hmm. particle physics, which also advocates extra dimensions, which advocates all kinds of, like, for example, there is a whole community working on anti deceiter space, which is not the space that we live in. We live in a deceiter space, which is an accelerating universe but they are able to solve the equations and find some interesting symmetries or some dualities in anti deceiver space. So they say, we will look for the keys under the lamppost. That's the place where we are able to solve, uh, make some mathematical breakthroughs, and therefore we will just work on it for decades. And they celebrate it. They give each other what. And I say, wait a minute. The reality that we live in is a deceiver space, not an anti deceiver space. So you can't just invent a reality, live in it, and just show off by doing mathematical gymnastics. And that happens to be the mainstream of theoretical particle physics. So I am asking, given that, how is it possible that when an object is peculiar, it looks anomalous, this is a real object, this is real data, then the astronomers ridicule the possibility that it might be artificial in origin just because they don't want it to be true, whereas ideas about realities that do not exist do gain traction in the mainstream. So the way to explain it is uh, that what is the service that these theoretical, hypothetical, unvalidated ideas serve in the mainstream? Well, they provide a sandbox for demonstrating that you're smart, okay? So people can show off and say, look, I did this mathematical manipulation and I'm, you know, I'm really clever. I was able to derive this and that. But the point is that physics is not about showing off. It's not about mathematical gymnastics. It's about figuring out the reality that we all share. And of course, mathematics could be about that, but that's not what physics is about. And so claiming that you are a physicist while doing just pure mathematics is not honest. You know, it's just like, um, I don't know, baking an omelet, making an omelet while you're claiming that you're a carpenter or something. <laughs> you know, like it's something, it's completely different. And uh, so as a physicist, we should be we should seek to figure out the reality that we all share. And I know it's a, you know, it's a natural tendency of humans, for example, to take recreational drugs because it makes you feel better. You see reality differently. And it's just your vision that is being obscured by the recreational drugs. It's not as if the reality changed. Uh, you feel better about yourself. That's perfectly fine. You can make this choice in your private life. But as a physicist, you can't write an article that reality suddenly changed. And the same about putting goggles on your head and living in the metaverse, where you may look like Brad Pitt for the rest of your life and be surrounded by celebrities. I mean, it gives you a good feeling about yourself, but it's not the reality that we all share. And so um, the purpose of physics should be to figure out that reality that we all share, because then it's repeatable. Then it's something that we can build on to adapt to it. You know, when we realize that the Earth moves around the sun, then we can build spacecraft that reach Mars 
uh, when we think that the Earth is the center of the universe, we would never reach Mars because we would think that Mars moves around, revolves around the Earth and the Sun revolves around the Earth. So the bottom line is, uh, if we want to adapt to the reality that we all share, then we have to understand it. And understanding it br uh, brings in the responsibility of um, trying to figure it out in a way that does not necessarily flatter our ego. And that is the difference between a belief system and a system that is based on uh, a, an experimental study of the reality that we share. So that is something that is important to, to realize. And apparently it's not realized uh, within the realm of science uh, separately from all these belief systems that we see in society otherwise. And, you know, scientists very often complain about uh, politicians as being... Uh, uh, narrow-minded as being uh, driven by wishful thinking, not paying attention to evidence. But if you find the same trends within academia, that's worrisome. And of course, uh, the only way to make progress in our knowledge about reality is to collect more evidence that will guide us so that we learn about uh, the way the universe is. And, and there is nothing more important than figuring out whether there, are, there is a smarter kid on our cosmic block, because, uh, uh, because that would uh, basically uh, give us a leap in our knowledge if we discover a gadget uh, of an extraterrestrial technological origin, it could represent our, the future of our technologies and could uh, educate us about new physics that we haven't figured out yet. So it's a learning experience for us and uh, even though it may feel as if we are looking over the shoulder of a smarter kid uh, uh, in our class, uh, and by that, uh, you know, instead of solving the problem ourselves, you know, if we save ourselves uh, a million years or a billion years in the process, it's worth it. So that's uh, my basic uh, perspective on this. And uh, I very much hope that this subject of searching for advanced technological civilizations will become mainstream uh, in our, within science, because it's the most important uh, uh, question that we can ask. Uh, and if we discover that we are not alone, that will change our perspective about our place in the universe and our aspirations for space in the future. And um, uh, it, it's much more important than answering question, for example, what is the nature of uh, most of the matter in the universe, dark matter, that would have little impact on our daily lives. But uh, figuring out that uh, there is a more advanced uh, civilization that predated us would change everything, would change uh, our politics, would change our religion. Uh, and if this is such an important question that most of society cares about, more, uh, government also cares about, how can the scientific community regard it as an extraordinary quest that uh, we will only pursue if we have extraordinary evidence. Uh, I say this should be mainstream right now, and uh, we should allocate as much resources as, as we can afford, the similar to the resources we allocated to the Large Hadron Collider. Yeah, and I, I hope these conversations help sort of realize that goal. I mean, the more people that are having conversations with people like yourself and putting it out there, I think the quicker we'll reach that sort of perspective. And in terms of what we might find if we are going to, to probe the solar system and farther afield in the universe, and whether it's they're coming to us or we, we make contact otherwise, what's your, what's your sense of what we might expect? Because, I, again, I think reading in your blog, you, you share the same opinion as me, which is people are very quick to sort of assume that they might be nefarious or resource gathering, and that's kind of their, their motivation. But it seems to me it's much more likely that we are going to meet a friend and somebody who, as you said, will save us millions to billions of years. Right. So the way I think of this is, um, you know, interstellar travel takes a long time. So even for light, it takes tens of thousands of years to traverse the Milky Way galaxy alone. And um, um, the nearest star is four light years away. Uh, but with chemical propulsion, it takes much longer by a factor of 10,000. So uh, it takes half a billion years to traverse the Milky Way galaxy. And biological creatures would not survive that journey. I mean, uh, they were selected uh, by evolution to survive on a rock like the Earth. Uh, and uh, 
the physical conditions in interstellar space are hazardous. There are energetic particles that can cause damage to our bodies. So we are not, and also our lifetime is so short, lifespan. And so it makes much more sense to send the technological devices that they are equipped with artificial intelligence that could survive the journey for a long time and have the patience to go through it. And so that's what I imagine we will encounter. Now, uh, we had our science only for one century. You know, quantum mechanics was discovered 100 years ago and uh, all of our gadgets, the internet, the cell phones, the computers, the reason that the two of us are communicating is because of the understanding of quantum mechanics. And uh, it's only a hundred years ago, and that's one part in a hundred in a hundred million of the age of the universe, of most stars. So um, uh, most likely we will not find another civilization exactly at the same phase as our uh, development. Uh, and uh, if they are more primitive than we are, the way we were for millions of years, then we will have to board the spaceship, land on their planet, and start searching through the trees and bushes. And that's a lot of work, uh, we will, and it will take a long time. Uh, however, there is the second possibility that they are much more advanced than we are. And uh, in that case, we just need to look up uh, because they may be visiting us. And we could learn from them. That's the other benefit. So. I think that we will find gadgets that would look like miracles to us in the sense if they are functional. I mean, we could also find space trash that is not functional in the way that our spacecraft, you know, the interstellar spacecraft we, we sent, uh, like New Horizons, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, there were five of them. And within a billion years, they will not be functional. They will be just space trash. And if they collide with another planet, they would appear as meteors, except that their composition will be unusual. And that's what we are trying to find near Papua New Guinea. But if, if they're functional, you know, if there are devices that last the journey, then it's most likely that we will see artificial intelligence systems and we will need to interpret their intent. Uh, we don't have a protocol for dealing with that. And... Uh, with a visitor in our backyard, and it requires immediate attention. And I think we will need to use our own uh, AI systems to figure out their AI systems. And frankly, I would much rather uh, favor the company of psychologists or philosophers or linguists than the company of physicists, because these other scholars are used to interpreting intelligent systems, whereas physicists are used to interpreting physical objects, so they are not suited for the task of finding out what the intent of those gadgets is. And and for that reason, that's why you sort of prescribe that there's no reason prior to any detection or interaction to come up with some sort of ET manual, I think is how you put it. But do you, do you think we could not develop sort of a general, almost like a meta plan where we have a process in place for if and when we have some sort of detection or interaction? We have different pathways to pursue that then can be sort of executed in the moment? Well, what, what we can uh, lay out, uh, let's say, in a committee as the possibilities, uh, that would be based on our imagination, our experience as humans. And as I argued before, it's likely that they're much more advanced than we are. So our imagination is quite limited. And most likely, if there is a functioning device, uh, then it will be something that goes beyond our imagination, okay? And in that case, we should get as much data as possible about the device uh, to figure out the intent, what kind of information is it seeking, what are the characteristics of the device, is it really a risk, uh, what can we learn from it? And only when we collect that data, we will have a better chance of doing the right thing. But just imagining what it might be ahead of time, I think doesn't make much sense, especially because any such committee that we establish will sort of um, uh, converge to uh, the common denominator of the committee members. And, you know, I think we will all be surprised by the visitor. Now, of course, if we are encountering a, a piece of 
space trash, a non-functional thing like the meteor in Papua New Guinea, then it doesn't require any, any thought. We just need to figure out the composition, where it came from, and perhaps uh, re recover some, some piece of it if, if it exists. Um, but for a functional device, I, I think the prudent thing to do is actually get as much data as possible and only then decide how to respond to it. And if we have yeah. to, if we have to communicate with it, I would much rather have a woman do it um, because women have much better communication skills. Yeah, I would have to agree. It doesn't sound very appealing to have a you know a general or something of the sort be the one leading that conversation. <laughs> Definitely. Right. Um, so another thing related to this topic is you've talked about sort of what should be the basis of astrobiology in the search for extraterrestrial life. And one of the things that's on everyone's tongues, as you've written about, is looking at the atmospheres of distant exoplanets. And, you know, for example, using James Webb to probe their atmospheres and look for gases that we consider to be anthropogenic, CFCs, certain methylated compounds, that type of that type of thing. But you've argued that actually we should more or less stay put and develop the, the instrumentation and the techniques we have to detect signals here on Earth and and locally and search for meaning because, which again, uh, not to be continuously agreeable, but sincerely, I, I, the chat, the problem that I've had with, with the atmosphere probing is even if we are to say, okay, we detected CFCs at a, at, a, at a variety of different exoplanets, hundreds, thousands of light years away, we don't really, we're not really any step closer. I mean, you can imagine complex chemistries where these sorts of molecules came from from natural sources whereas if we look for meaning and we are able to decipher meaning it is a conclusive marker for life right so uh, for 70 years we've been looking for radio signals and that's because we developed radio communication and uh, that's just like waiting for a phone call at home and i argue that searching for packages in our mailbox near us is a much better method and that was not done uh, until the Galileo project. So uh, that's a new approach, and I think it's co completely complementary to the traditional approach. For some reason, the SETI community is hostile to this approach. Not clear to me why, because it's a completely different approach, and it, you know, all the objects that we found from interstellar space, three of them, the first three, appear to be different, unfamiliar. Uh, and so, you know, we should be open-minded and, and figure out what they are. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, obviously, um, you know, we should um, uh, look for any other techno signatures. And I've written papers on, as you said, searching for um, uh, industrial pollution in the atmospheres of planets or searching for the city lights on the night side of planets. But Finding an object from another civilization is far better. It contains much more information because, especially if it's functional, uh, you know, it can educate us about new technologies uh, that we could imitate. Uh, it could be worth a lot of money for business people. Um, you know, in Silicon Valley, suddenly they'll have a new gadget to play with or to imitate. Um, so altogether, it's a very different experience to have a visitor in your backyard compared to looking at something from afar. I should say that a radio signal, suppose that we were to detect it from a star that is 10,000 light years away, uh, obviously there is no immediate need for a response uh, because it would take our response 10,000 years to, to reach the, the source. And it's possible that in 10,000 years, uh, that civilization is a, at a completely different place in, in their history, you know. That's also why if we find gadgets in our backyard, they were not sent, they were not sent to spy on us because uh, we did not exist when they left their uh, home uh, star or planetary system. Um, they were probably sent uh, uh, as a swarm of probes towards many stars aiming to achieve some goal and has nothing to do with us. It's not about us. We should think of us as ants in the crack of a pavement when a biker is passing by. You know, the, obviously the biker cares less about the ants. 
Yeah, definitely. And again, it goes back to sort of the Copernican principle of we are the center of the universe. We have good reason to believe we are uniquely intelligent. But as you've said, considering the vastness of the universe, no way. There's just no way. Right. So we're getting a little close to the end of time. So I'll ask you one final question, if that's all right with you. Um, this is related to, to both of the aforementioned articles. And you brought up a statement by Steven Weinberg, where he said, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. And I certainly take your point uh, in the vein that we're talking about now. But to me, I took that statement as more of a fundamental meaning. There's no existential, I suppose, meaning to, to existence and to the universe. And I was curious if you would agree with that sentiment. Not necessarily, because um, the question is whether part of the universe was shaped by intelligence. Now, we know that um, the way we define intelligence is the ability to change reality uh, based on your guiding principles. So we started developing tools early on. We f discovered fire and then we built tools that allow us to hunt uh, better. And by now we are sending spacecraft to space and leaving our planet. And uh, in the future, we could even change uh, Mars, you know, by terraforming it, by putting humans there and changing the geological uh, atmospheric conditions on Mars artificially, okay? So you can imagine that uh, given enough time, a technological civilization would change its environment. And the question is, suppose uh, ultimately such a civilization discovers how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity and is able to engineer a baby universe in the laboratory. So if you can create a baby universe, or if you can create life in the laboratory, that changes everything. Because then it's possible that our universe, everything we know about that Steven Weinberg claimed is pointless, actually has a point. Because if it was created by a scientist in a white lab coat, then the point is that this is what we called all along God. You know, So it ends up being a unification of science and religion in some sense. And that changes everything. I, I, you know, if our universe was created in a laboratory, then it has a point because someone wanted it to exist. It's just like if, if you are born and you don't meet your parents and then you ask yourself, okay, well, how did I come to exist? Well, it's completely pointless. But then you go back and search your roots and you realize who your parents are, that, that brings sense to your life in some way. Closure to all these unanswered questions of what happened at the Big Bang and so forth. But even if it's not the Big Bang, even if it's just life, you know, maybe life was seeded on Earth, okay, by some other civilization artificially. Uh, just to give you an example, you know, Mars lost its uh, atmosphere and therefore liquid water on its surface somewhere between two and two and a half billion years ago. Guess what? The oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere rose sharply around that time. So suppose there was a civilization on Mars uh, that came to exist, became technological uh, at half the amount of time that was needed here on Earth for us. So instead of 4.6 billion years, it took 2.3 billion years. And then... Uh, that civilization realized that uh, the Martian atmosphere is about to be dislodged, uh, and as a result, they cannot stay there. The first thing they would discuss in their politics is, what about this other planet, the Earth? We want to terraform it. So they would uh, make cyanobacteria uh, more, more abundant, more prolific in making oxygen, and perhaps that's the origin of complex life on Earth, that uh, we were all... Martians in some sense, and then uh, uh, life migrated to Earth. So, I mean, this is a hypothetical scenario, but I'm just giving it as an example of a situation where our existence could be explained by some parents. Even if they didn't create the universe, if they planted the seeds of life, complex life here on Earth, that would uh, change our perspective. That would bring a point to this story. Uh, so I don't agree with Steven Weinberg. I think uh, his approach is just based on assuming the universe is composed of physical objects. We know that this is not the whole story because we exist. 
Yeah, no, it's true. And it also highlights just how much more there is to learn and how many possibilities there really are. And it's always great to end on the big question. So thank you very much. And thank you for coming on. Thanks for the questions. I really enjoyed it.